the last session on the last day. I'm glad who we have who we have here. Well, welcome everybody to Vector Magic with SolidWorks Composer. My name is Michael Steves. I'm Senior Application Engineer with Quest Integration. Uh, Co-presenting to me, he'll be coming up a little bit later, is Silas Kerfman, Mechanical Engineer with FSI Fabrication. Uh, FSI is a customer of ours. Uh, so, why are you all here? You decided to stick around for the last session. What are you going to get out of this? What do you guys want to get out of this? Well, hopefully you read the description before coming in. We got caught some of your interests. So by the end of this session, you'll want to understand, or you will understand, the reasons and benefits of using scalable vector graphics. Understand how to create them. Well, hopefully some of you have used SolidWorks Composer before. Ideally, you've taken the using SolidWorks Composer training class because we're about to get into that technical illustration workshop and blow your minds. Really see what you can do with these SVGs. So to help with that, we'll give you some vision. Silas will cover some of the tools, techniques that he uses to get the most out of this output from SolidWorks Composer. Because this is, I think, the reason why I really want to put this presentation together is I think this is where you're going to start seeing this go in terms of technical communication and having it be online. Of course, Silas has many other examples that he'll get into um, that aren't online uh, and using these SVGs. Now I know everyone's brains are full. It's been a long few days. <laughs> what are you going to hold on to out of this presentation? Hopefully you'll get at least one golden nugget that you can take back and use and share with your team, uh, share with your processes. Um, but before we get into any of that, kind of help to, to help reset you, uh, I want to get into a little, bit, uh, a little bit of a story. So go ahead. Spend the next couple of minutes, close your eyes. Don't snore. don't snore. Yeah, don't fall asleep. This is just a little, little meditation exercise. Close your eyes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through a story here. You're a farmer, and you're about to take your 10-wheeler truck out and fertilize your land. It's a beautiful day. The sun is kissing your face. Similar to when I got here and the Phoenix sun was kissing mine. It makes it feel that much better. You turn the key to start your truck. The familiar sounds and vibration help you settle, settle in for a rewarding day's work. You drive your truck over to the field and get ready. You have a full load of fertilizer and you're ready to flip the switch to get it start spreading it out. So, you flip the switch. Nothing happens. This can't happen. You flip it off, flip it back on again. Still, nothing. What's wrong? This can't happen. Your crop needs its food. Your family needs their food. Operation of your machines is critical. This day is quickly going downhill. So, you reach for your owner's manual, only to find that some of the pages have been ripped out. And hey, if they were in there, they'd probably be too dirty to read anyway. Well, the information was probably out of date. You've purchased other maintenance manuals before. You've purchased other equipment and had an issue of the mismatch of the data. Now what? Well, fortunate for you, you purchased a FSI fabrication easy spread spreader. This means that you have immediate access to accurate online information, the online manual necessary for your repairs. But there's another downside. You're in the middle of rural America. If you're going to get any internet, it's probably going to be very slow. Well, once again, FSI has your back. This information that they have online is lightweight, easy to use, and interactive. So you will be able to get your spreader up and running in no time and complete your tasks for the day. So go ahead, open your eyes. What would this 
magic hat look like? What would this information look like? Well, the answer is SVGs. We'll get into that a little bit. But before I do, uh, I told you I work for Quest Integration. Quest Integration is a reseller for SolidWorks in Washington State, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. And we've been doing this since 1998. As a senior application engineer with Quest Integration, one of my uh, job duties is providing pre- and post-sales support for SolidWorks Composer. So I actually did the training at FSI a few years ago when they purchased. Uh, did many other training classes on that uh, on SolidWorks Composer since. And the story of you know needing correct information now continues to resonate uh, through my customers. And of course, adopting latest technology, latest trends, and Silas will speak on some of this as well. Um, and I was very happy to see it was last fall at the Yakima SolidWorks User Group, um, just very close to where FSI is located. Uh, when I saw what Silas has been able to do with Composer and the SVGs that he's created. So needless to say, I was very impressed and wanted to put on this presentation with him. But before we get to that, wait, why, why SVG? Why scalable vector graphics in the first place? Well, there's three reasons why you're going to choose vector versus raster. And some of you may have seen this before, right? Resolution, usability, flexibility. Now, if you're going to look up SVG or vector graphic online, this is one of the images that you'll find. And if you're after detail, right, clear, concise detail, especially if it's images, which one are you going to choose? There's an obvious choice here. Right? If you have a complex machine, complex machinery, complex details, you need to zoom in, get whatever you're going to get. Well, if you're zooming in here, which, which is going to be clearer for you? Which one's going to be better for you? Which one's going to be better for your assembly crew, which is going to be better for your customers that are buying and using your product. What about the usability? Great. Resolution, no brainer. How are we going to use it? Well, for those of you who have been using Composer for a few years and maybe have generated some of these SVGs in the past, uh, you likely came across the Adobe SVG Viewer. Now, you can still download this, but this is what you see when you go to that web page to download that plugin. And that's the other icky thing about it, right? It's a plugin. If you're going to have to give this to your customers, these SVG graphics to your customers, do they need to download a plugin? Are they going to, can they install a plugin? Can they download additional software on their computer? Who knows? So there's two scenarios I want to take you through here in regards to how are we going to use these SVGs? Sure, these plugins are great. I mean, I still use it in some cases. I have customers that use it in some cases. If you're looking at, so two scenarios, so here's the first scenario. Your customers are spread all around the world, right? Do you have control of their computers, what they're doing with them? No. We want to make this as easy to use as possible. So are we going to use a plugin? Do we want to provide a format that requires a plugin to use? No. You're likely going to cause them pain, and then they don't want to come back to your website, and they're not going to use your manual. So this is where uh, we've been able to utilize uh, some of the latest tools and emerging, emerging technologies with HTML uh, with these scalable vector graphics. So you can open an SVG in practically any browser. Silas will bring up a, a website a little bit. I know um, outside the door it asks you to turn off your cell phones, but hopefully you have them available. You'll be able to pull up a website a little bit later. But it's flex it's, this kind of gets into the flexibility of it, right? But what's that other scenario? This is where I have customers using these plugins. If you're using this lightweight SVG graphic information in a controlled environment, shop floor instructions, assembly instructions, parts lists on the shop floor, who's running those computers? Who's responsible for those? Well, someone's installed, set up that computer, if it's IT or uh, wh whoever's responsible for those machines. But regardless, it's a controlled environment. Use those plugins. It does increase the usability in many cases. But again, it's not required. So again, with this flexibility and getting into HTML5, you know, think about how your customers are going to access this data. If it's on a computer, tablet, mobile device, whatever it may be. The benefit here is with HTML5, SVG is built right in. 
So there's CSS, there's style sheets, there's JavaScript that you can configure and interact with these SVGs to really take it to the next level. And you'll see what Silas has been able to do here. So I guess with that said, uh, I do want to share a couple nuggets that I found going through training, working with some other customers um, to explore some of the options and help you, make, uh, help you become more familiar with what you can do with this output from SolidWorks Composer. So I'll get a little hands-on in a little bit, but a couple slides I want to show you first to just give you an overview um, and give you some visual comparison side by side of what can we control in this output, right? And, and what does that mean? Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier is uh, vector graphic. Who's used vector graphics before? Okay, go, go, actually go ahead and keep your hands up, I'm curious. If you've used SVG graphics before, keep your hands up, okay? Now, has anyone used DWGs, DXFs? Keep your hands up if you have, or raise your hand now. Okay, so actually everyone, everyone is raising their hands up. Everyone is used, guess what? Vectors, everyone's used them. Everyone has used them. But one of the big benefits here of using SolidWorks Composer to generate this is there's a lot of information that we can use. There's a lot of information that we can configure and control to really get exactly what we want. But a couple things that are out of the box that you can use right away are just some of the options for line weights, shadows, turning those on and off, right? What's gonna be better for you? Which, which experience do you wanna give to your data consumer, your, your customer? So I'll show you here in a little bit, but there's an option for silhouettes and composer that you can enable, disable, and then um, also affect the line weight. So generate that out of the box. Now here's the cool thing. Comparing to DWG's DXFs, there's much more data here. You don't necessarily see it just in the image, but every actor, as we know how to call it in composer, has a property. So when we take a look at this later, we can actually get into Wait, you wanna change the color of the silhouettes? You wanna increase intensity, change the behavior of it? This is, this is out of the box now, or outside what's in the box of Composer. But you can, it's there. The information is generated from Composer, creates it with these properties. So again, this is using out of the box functionality to, to give you some of these uh, different images, these vector graphics. Um, but again, it's smart. There's gonna be more and more detail that we can do here. I think the other critical thing here is there's also a fill property. You see shadows here, but of course we can enable color when we output these SVGs. And can you tell me the difference between these two images? It's kind of hard to tell, but it makes a little trip, uh, give you a little trivia. Outlines, yeah, the outlines are a little clearer. Where do you see the outlines? Yeah, more in the blue part, don't you? Yeah. Well, it's actually, it's, uh, there's a little bit of lighting that you're seeing there. So there is a different color because we have a higher color depth, we're saying. We can use a broader spectrum, um, more colors to choose from, so it'll give us that gradient. Here, here's the cool thing about it. Um, when I've talked with other folks about Composer, because um, um, it, it can be used all over the board. I have um, engineering companies, designers using it, um, marketing teams, sales teams. Um, I, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that I get on this is, if you open up one of these SVGs in like Illustrator or Photoshop, oh my gosh, <laughs> like there's so much data that I can come in here, edit it, change it. Because all of these fields, all these colors that you see here is another layer, it's another component that we can change and have control of to get exactly what we want if this isn't enough for you. Now one of the other things here that we can do with the uh, images that we're creating, these graphics, well, not only can we change the appearance and behavior that you'll see later, um, but we can also create links. How many of you knew that you could create links? And I guess what I mean by links is I click on a an actor, a component, maybe a subassembly from a view, and it takes me to the exploded view of that subassembly. Did you know we could do that? Yeah, very good. This was an e intermediate level for a reason. So, to, not everyone, is about maybe a third. Um, let me just talk a little bit about that. And I want to show you uh, how we can control this. So with links, links, when you think of links, what do you think of? Web pages, right? I click a link, it takes me somewhere else. That's exactly what we're doing here. 
Now, depending on your experience with Composer, you also are familiar with that this link property is powerful for animations, interactive uh, documentation, right? One of the applications for Composer is assembly instructions, interactive assembly instructions. So it will show you out of an entire animation, it'll start, automatically stop after a series is done and blink at you. Component will blink at you and say, hey, click me when you're ready. So you click it, takes you to the next segment. Blink, 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 blink. Click, take you to the next one, right? So there's, there's a lot of functionality built in with these links, but I'm gonna dumb it down for you here. If we're looking at online documentation, we, we're not getting that complex, right? I'm just linking to something else. Well, what are we gonna link to? If you click the browse button here in Composer, it's going to give you a browser, a window, to just say, okay, well, what do you want to link to? Web page, file, FTP site, or there's a, a bunch of different properties inside Composer that you can, you can link to. We don't need to do that. Here's a, here's a tip for you. If you know you're gonna be putting this on the web, just type in the file name that you're after, and the, file, the, the relative file path. You know what I mean by that, the relative file path? Now, let me just say, I'm no web developer. <laughs> I've got a little bit of programming knowledge, but I, am, I, can, I, I'm an, I know enough to be dangerous here, right? I know how to create a link in HTML. It's not too hard. Just, um, but that's, that's what it's doing here, and I wanna show you a little bit of that here. But again, it's, we can really simplify the, the use of these links. Um, let, me, yeah, let me show you what I mean by that, that relative file path. All right, so here we are with one of those sub-assemblies. Tell you what, what I wanna do is take you back to the, the primary assembly. This is, in fact, one of Silas's uh, spreaders here. Um, well, let's talk about some of those links. So we have properties of these actors, right? So if we select any of our actors, go down the left-hand side, and you'll see, hey, guess what? Here's our event, there's our link. If I click the browse button here, I can browse to you know, whatever document I want. Now if there is another SVG that I want to link here, and indeed there is, this is the complicated way of doing it, right? I can come in, specify file, choose that document, it puts that link, right, into, it's gonna put this link embedded into that SVG. So when you click on it, it's gonna take me right there. But again, this is, we're creating more work for us here. Simplify it, right? Put in the relative file path. Now, what I mean by relative file path, I'm gonna create a new SVG file, it's gonna go in the same folder. So relative file path, what is it? It's just the file name. Now I could have subfolders here of like, uh, for images, SVGs, whatever it may be, and then you can use, um, right, just the folder name, and then um, the file name. Again, it's relative to where that SVG is located. Now. The other thing here, and this is a little bit different, so it's a little, uh, know what's going on in the SVG itself. Use forward slashes, not backslashes, when putting in those relative uh, folder paths, file paths. So, forward slash, otherwise it won't work. But obviously you wanna troubleshoot it before you give it to your customer. All right, so this is the primary link. I wanna take it into the sub-assembly or the exploded view here. So, in this case, I'm gonna go to two. 2.svg, fantastic, that's it. All right, let's create our SVG. So again, utilize different properties here, and actually, by the way, hopefully some of you have explored this before, but this is a couple of the top questions that I do get. Um, global line width, you saw some of the examples earlier. This global line width is a factor associated to the outline width and silhouette width, if it's on. So it's a factor, one times 0.3, guess what? What's my outline line width going to be? I, everyone's brain is very full. I'm trying to simplify the math as best as I can. What's it gonna be? It's 0.3 times one, so we're at 0.3, all right. Now, okay, here's one of the other primary questions. In fact, I was thrilled to hear him pronounce it correctly this morning at the general session. This option here. How do you pronounce that first word? 
Bezier, fantastic, love it. Let's work. Nine times out of ten, guess what I hear? Bezier. <laughs> Bezier, very good. Um, all right, and I think you know, 2015 enhanced some help here. Um, so take a look at the help documentation. It goes into nice detail for all of these options, so I won't bore you with those. Um, so I think yeah, at this point, let me just uh, save as, create out that new SVG file. Fantastic. Here we are. Guess what? Hover my mouse over my actors, they highlight. And that's some of the, the hotspot creation here uh, that you can modify in the properties. Um, but I click it, takes me to the next view, browsing right to that file in my folder on my desktop. But again, this um, would behave just as if you need to uh, online. It's all local at this point. Um, but one thing I do want to cover, if you do need to modify any of this information, use a tool like Notepad, Notepad++, a text editor to get in here. Now, Silas has some additional tips that he'll get into. Um, but if you do need to change the link here at all, search for it. So what was my link to? 2.svg? Yeah, 2.svg. So it takes me throughout all the magic that there is of, uh, of SVGs, and here's my link, 2.svg. So if you find yourself that you use the browse button in the link property, you created your SVG, now you need to clean it up. So use the search method to come in, find, and do a uh, replace. Right, you can do a replace all to correct these links. Man, very good. All right, so hopefully that gives you just a little sense of how easy, again, it is to create um, these SVG files. Um, some of the tips associated to configuring them and uh, creating these links, accessing other documents. Because again, does an SVG have to link to an SVG? No, it can link to whatever you want. So I'm going to invite uh, Silas up here. Um, please help me work, welcome him up um, as we get into seeing his examples, how he's been able to use Composer and see some of the tools and techniques that he has. So Silas. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, you're probably not aware of it. If it wasn't for you being here, I wouldn't be here myself. So uh, although I've been a SOLIDWORKS user for a lot of years, this is the first time I've got to attend SOLIDWORKS World. Uh, it happens to be our biggest trade show of the year is exactly the same week as SOLIDWORKS World every, every year. So as, a, as Michael said, my name is Silas Kirpin. I'm a mechanical engineer at FSI Fabrication. We are a small family business an OEM of mobile ag, ag equipment up in Sunnyside, Washington State. Uh, been in business for about, since about 65. Our CAD experience uh, about the last 12 years is SOLIDWORKS. Before that was AutoCAD, AutoCAD Lite. Before that, if you've ever heard of it, generic CAD. And then uh, just drafting, hand drafting after that. A little bit about our products. Um, over 60 years, we've had a lot of chance to make a lot of different things. Uh, the last 10 years or so, we've really narrowed it down to about three product lines. Our main focus right now is equipment that will feed cattle or cattle feeders, uh, equipment to spread the animal waste, and equipment semi-trailers for hauling commodities back and forth between farms and, and ranches and dairies and such. And that's really where our SOLIDWORKS data is, is in our current three or so product lines. Our customers are a wide range, even though we're a small company. Um, we have customers, everything from the largest dairies and feedlots down to the smallest mom and pops and international as well. Uh, and our, this, we're in an interesting time with ag right now. You know, agriculture as an industry is, you could argue that it's about the oldest industry there is. You know, human history have always had to grow food. In the last 50 years or so, things have changed so dramatically. 
Um, you know, economic pressures, environmental pressures, uh, things are really pushing thing, uh, the farmers and ranchers to run at efficiency levels never seen before. Um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of us still see ag as uh, you know kind of a mom and pop farm type thing, and in reality, ag is some of the fastest and most ready adopters of new technology there is. You know, technologies like GPS and IoT, Internet of Things, and CAN bus, ISO bus, these have been day to day part of living in ag for years. A sub inch accurate GPS. Um, you know, they might not be out, you know, beating a drum, telling everybody, you know, how high tech they are, but it, it's a matter, it's, it is how things operate in that world now. But for as much changes there have been technology wise, there's a lot of things that stay the same. And, you know, we've got new demands and old constraints. There's no amount of new technology that can change the fact that harvest still happens in a certain window of time over the year. You know, we can't stretch it out over 12 months so that we can, they can have eight to five jobs. You know, so time is critical, unlike almost every, almost any other industry, ag has a really unique time crunch. And the same goes for land and space. Again, no, no amount of science or technology is gonna, has been allowed, has allowed us to fit a thousand acres worth of crops into a hundred acres. So we are still spread out into remote areas and will be for, you know, a long time. So we've got the, the, all this new tech, but we still have incredible constraints on time and, you know, the space to use it in. You know, gone are the days where a, a farmer could go out possibly and make a, a repair with duct tape and bailing wire and get going. Anymore, you're likely to see somebody, a laptop, you know, a tech come out with a laptop and a bus analyzer. It's, it's just really a whole different world. And that's the, you know, that's the world that we work in. Um, since FSI is a small company, everybody there has to be ready to step into a lot of different roles on a moment's notice. We all wear a lot of different hats. And for instance, although my primary job is product development and design, I'm also responsible for every other area where images or illustrations of our equipment might be needed. And there's the typical ones you would think of like, you know, production prints or product manuals, documentation, things like that. But at FSI it also includes everything from commercial printing to safety signage, uh, decals, multimedia, web animations, um, and just on from there. And it's a lot of hats to wear. And some people really thrive in a dynamic environment with multitasking and a lot of hats and some people don't. And I'm actually in the don't camp. <laughs> Multitasking is just multi-failing really fast to me. So, you know, with that type of situation, what, what's, you, what's a guy to do? At the very least, we say, okay, we've well, got all of this data in SOLIDWORKS for this product line. At the very least, I should be able to just spit out images from SOLIDWORKS to, to fit these needs. And sort of true, sort of not. And that's where Composer has come in for us. And we'll go into a little bit of, of what makes some of these areas challenging. And uh, just to sit, I'll see if that works. Okay. You know, patent illustrations. Um, you know, these, this is a patent that we have in the mix, right? We just, right, we just actually finished filing and everything like that. So this is one of ours. Uh, and if you've ever dealt with the patent office, maybe you've been through the ringer, they have really distinct federal guidelines on everything from line weight, line type, margins, where you can put a page number, what happens to your ratios when you switch from portrait to landscape. It's really a lot of rules. Now to their credit, they are getting a little bit better at recognizing so much stuff is being done in 3D solid models. Um, but depending on the examiner you get, they may still be old school and you've got to fit what, you know, you've got to fit your product, your, your SOLIDWORKS data into this box and shoehorning SOLIDWORKS into this type of set of rules can't, you know, it's possible, but it can be really challenging. And that's where, you know, sometimes a vector image, and we'll talk about that, has been an, an, a better choice for us.
Another one is commercial printing. I'm sure maybe some of you have had this experience. Uh, you know, somebody in marketing wants to make a poster or a decal or embroidered hats or something. I need an image of something. So, okay, I'll give you a JPEG and I'll make it really nice. I'll make it 600 DPI and it'll be a monster. And, you know, you, you could have all the resolution you could want and then they kick it right back to you. And I said, nope. Well, you know, commercial printing and things like that, they work on a little bit different constraints than we do. You know, these are big printing machines that have a container or a cartridge or a foil for every single color. You know, they want their images in a way where they can grab or color pick colors within your image on the whole and alter, or tweak, or, or swap them out. And then the printers themselves, mechanically, I mean, they're taking that information almost like a router does a CNC G code. I mean, they need instructions, you know, move this line, move, go here, and that's where the vector images are, you know, that's why they're so important in that industry. You know, animations, um, some of you might remember playing with you know, SolidWorks or renderings and things like that, making animations 10 years or so ago and you let something run all night long so you can get maybe 30 frames and take a look the next morning and, okay, well, that's not what I want. <laughs> uh, we've been using Composer to get for lack of a better word, some quick and dirty, but they're animations that are ready to go. That's an example of one right here, and if we have enough time, I can, I can play it during the question and answer. Uh, I got a call one day, uh, you know, like I said, family business in one location, no distributors. Uh, my father and brother are out making a sale, a state away. Uh, they're trying to talk to this customer and explain how they'd like to lay out some equipment. There's some confusion. They call me up. You know, they were really asking anything at the time, but I'm listening, and I say, you know what, let me see what I can do. Get on Google Earth, punch in the address, I can see the farm, I can see the building they're talking about, you know, take a screenshot of that, pull up SolidWorks, make a really quick building, bring the screenshot, the building, and my existing equipment into Composer, arrange it the way they're talking about, do a flyby, kick it out and do an animation, put it on our YouTube channel, and tip to tail, Two hours later, the customer had it on a mobile device in a rural area looking at a flyby of what we were pitching to him. You know, so that's another one. Did you get the order? Not yet, but they're slow. <laughs> it's always a slow process. And then finally, you know, wrapping up, kind of just about to come full circle here to where Michael left off, using SVGs and vector images in our technical documentation, Again, this is kind of like what you run into with commercial printing. If you're going to spit everything out in raster and bitmaps and you're going to give it to somebody who's working on a product manual in Adobe or MS Publisher, it might work, but the more of those raster images you give that person, the more pages that document gets, it starts slowing down a lot. If you are working in that environment and you have the option to use vector images, like EPS or SVG, it can really make life a lot easier for whoever's doing that technical writing. Uh, you, it, it makes, you know, you don't have to, if they decide they want a thumbnail view of something or they want, you gave them a thumbnail view of something and they want a bigger one, you don't have to go back and re-output something at a different resolution. They can use that same one and just drag it to a different size. And that's, uh, that's now coming into our mobile web pages that we've been working on and see some of that here. If you have a mobile device with you uh, and you've got a second to try to open up one of these, I'd really encourage you to go ahead and try uh, fsifab.com beaters HTML or Draper HTML. Pull it up on the browser on your device, see what happens, pinch and zoom the illustration, touch it around, rotate your screen, Anybody, is it coming up or I hope? <laughs> beaters. beaters. This was actually a close call. We were testing this, what, two nights ago? Yeah. I mean, it worked three days ago and two nights ago we were testing it. Like, hey, I can't get to that page. And I can't get to that page either. And then I checked the whole site and it's like, oh, the whole site's down. Yeah. So, but found out our uh, GoDaddy credit card expired and just had to <laughs> punch in the new Nate. And so we're back up and live now. Yeah. <laughs> Funny how that works, huh? 
you know, it's just, it's native browser, you know, there's no plugins, it's just browser generated information. So I'd like to get ready to jump in here. I want to make sure, yeah, it looks like we've got time to, to do a quick walkthrough and then still have Q&A. Before I tell you what my tools, favorite tools are, I, I, do, I just want to reiterate, just like Michael said, I am not a web guy. I am not a web developer. I'm not an ex web page developer that then came into a SOLIDWORKS environment. I'm a machinist who went to engineering who then became, you know, started using SOLIDWORKS. My day to day life, I spend more time on a shop floor at a lathe or a mill than I do in tweaking website stuff. But that being said, just saying, you know, don't let it scare you away. You know, I, I think we're going to try to make it really ap approachable here what's going on. You know, favorite tools, of course, Composer Technical Illustration Workshop, Notepad++, again, for me, it's a great tool. Within Notepad++, I really recommend um, XML Tools as a plugin. And then within XML Tools is a really slick little trick called Pretty Print. If you remember when Michael did his uh, search for 2.svg, it was a tree in this massive forest of stuff. I mean, it just about make your head crack trying to figure it all out. Well, Pretty Print's going to clean that up for us. Uh, a graphic software is really helpful. Um, you can open up the SVGs in the browsers, yes, but if you open it up in a graphic software like CorelDRAW or Adobe Illustrator or Inkspace, which is free, that in that those software packages will also tell you as you touch different geometries, it'll give you information as far as, okay, within the SVG, that line or that fill is this number or that number, you know, and you can really map out a plan if you've got a little, you know, like I said, even ink space is free. And as far as testing them out, uh, right now currently my favorite is using Chrome browser to do that. Uh, partly because it's got some neat little inspection tools and view source, but mostly because when you're in inspection tools in Chrome browser, it has a simulation tool that you can see your website on different size devices, a Nexus, a Note, a Kindle Fire, you know, things like that, and it's pretty slick. So I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is um, went ahead and made a clip ahead of time of going through a workflow. And I'm just going to turn that clip on and just kind of walk through uh, a workflow and I'll, it, the clip starts a little bit before where Michael left off so I'm going to kind of push it forward just a bit and then let it go here. Okay, I'm sorry, what was the question? Is there a way to rotate the SVG? Uh, okay, the question was, is there a way to rotate the SVG? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's just the tip of the tip of the iceberg. You mean on that website on the on the How do you do it? Oh, on the website. Yeah. No um not right now, not on that page. That's just a test page, but there there are some the browsers can execute certain instructions there that will rotate, scale, transform, and do all sorts of tweaking to that SVG. Um, and then you can, you can give the viewers control of that tweaking, or you can set it up to be triggered by certain things like mouse events, uh, you know, mouse overs and mouse clicks and things like that. And actually that's kind of what All right, so, okay, so where we're at here is just a 
just validating some SVGs by opening them up in a browser. You know, just finished doing technical illustration workshop in Composer. Uh, this was one that we happened to have done a bomb with. When you use a bomb, it'll automatically make hotspots, is what I'm kind of passing the mouse over there. And that captions a little bit late. So I'm going to open up in Notepad uh, that same SVG that we were just testing in the Chrome browser. You know, a few elements to kind of be aware of. It has a header and things like that, just like a regular HTML website. You might recognize some of the some of the syntax. Um, you can have JavaScript, uh, even if you don't know exactly what JavaScript is. You can you can have JavaScript in there. You can have links like a href behavior. Now this is that big giant forest jungle that that we were just looking at here that you know you can do a search and replace in there. That big jungle is our what we're going to call our path. And that's really what you know the SVG is broken down into a logical organization of, of components. You know there's some header information, there's some style information at the top, and then towards the bottom when composer outputs these the where everything really sits is in these paths and within paths you've got the you've got the other items called groups and here I think I couldn't see that if I did it say that it turned pretty print on or the XML tools okay so it it blew that giant jungle into a readable set of groups now what's not shown there right now and you can have on your right hand side of notepad you can have you can turn on something called function viewer and it'll give you a breakdown of all those elements, actors, and that's, those are the, the basic elements that Composer spits out into an SVG. You're going to have actors, hotspots, um, and then a few unnamed paths. And so far, it, it looks like everything I've seen so far, actor 0, .0 or actor 0, .0 is just about the first one, and that's your shadows if you're going to have shadows. Um, and all of these actors are tweakable, they're all editable. Uh, you can get in there and change styling, which is Composer, Composer right now spits out the styling and that would be like the thickness or color of lines and things like that or the color of a fill or color of a shadow. Pretty much at the level of the actor. But what I'm doing here is you can also give an SVG some instructions about styling at the very top. So without going in and damaging or tweaking the actual, you know, the actors and hotspots and stuff, you can leave some instructions at the very top that, you know, give it, you know, when you get to something called hotspot or if you get to something called actor.3 or actor.4, you can use these different types of selectors to, dr to drill down and, and give certain components certain behaviors. And then again, you know, just get in there, break it apart, tweak it, play with it, save it. I mean, you're not going to break your computer here. It's not, it's just an SVG file. Open it up in a browser, check it out again. You know, one of the simplest modifications is to change the color of the hotspots. You know, we changed it from green to red, but you can do just about every new CSS styling method that, that is part of the new HTML5 standards you have at your disposal for SVGs too. You can, you can animate things, you can give them transitions, you can, as you animate things you can give it a slow fade in and a fade out. Uh, you can tweak line thicknesses. Now like I said, as you look at these individually, you know, they might not, one, one, on, one at a time, they might not really seem all that great, but you got to remember that the power here is you can combine them all day long, you know, and then, so it just really opens up the imagination and then just remember too, all these changes, I, if I'm in a big organization and maybe they initially only have one seat of Composer, I don't, you know, I'm not doing these changes with Composer. You know, I don't, you know, you can take all this stuff, do the tweaks, you know, if you've got somebody who's handling your website work, you know, they can do it. You know, another thing that a lot of people probably don't realize is the text in the bill of material, even though this is an image we're looking at, the text is not locked out raster. You know, you can change the bill of material entries in those rows of that table 
by going into the SVG and changing something. So, you know, if any of you hold off and drag your feet on creating illustrations and images because, you know, ERP hasn't given you part numbers yet, don't worry about it. Make them. You know, and then you can go back in and you can actually, re you know, modify or tweak those part numbers without, like I said, not even having to come back to Composer. I, I've done this with external. So CSS is your styling instructions um, and you get three choices for CSS. You get inline, internal and external. Inline seems to be the default output from Composer and that's when I said as you, as we look down at all those actors, each actor throughout the body of text may get its own style instruction. But you can do also internal which is like creating a paragraph at the very top of your SVG like a little introduction with all the instructions for the entire page or you can give a little instruction to the top of the page that says okay for everything from this point on there's a different file in the same folder or something. This is our external style sheet and it, it may have a lot more stuff and, there, and it, it is it, if you're going to do a lot of styling an external so style sheet is handy to have because you know if you're playing with wildly different styles um, maybe you have half a dozen different style sheets and you can leave that one pointer in the SVG pointing to style sheet one and then go back and tweak something in 1A or 1B or 1C and do a, you know, save it as style sheet one and all of the style instructions you have in that external sheet that you just played with now are going to be read when you open that SVG next time. You know, so again, just recapping some of the some of the basics changes, you know, color, fades, um, you know, moving, scaling elements, uh, modifying line weights, things like that. It's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that you can do. And I'm not even, you know, I can't even imagine, you know, what, what else combinations could be, could be used. It's just, and like I said, it, you, I'm not using Composer. I'm not a web guy. And it didn't take very long to get in there, make a few tweaks, changes, and boom, it's there. It doesn't require ActiveX, no plugins, I'm available on different devices, pinch and zoom, the, you know, the, it rescales itself, you know, so it's a matter of at this point, what are the other applications? Oh, that was the last one. Okay. Let's see. Great, 10 minutes. I was really excited to get to a point where I could do some question and answer um, and if there doesn't end up being many questions, I've left some other samples and demos and stuff I could pull up and, uh, but first I'd like to, questions for either me or Michael? Yes. Okay. So you're you're wanting it still to be kind of like a 3D interaction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, right? Can I have the SVG graphic behave more like a 3D e drawing, a 3D PDF, so you can rotate, zoom in and out? Very familiar to what we've all seen in e drawings, right? Um, and I think the only, one of the things here of um, you got to look at your application. What's what is what do you want that experience to be? Because if you want 3D, SVG may not be the best example because um, it's a it's a 2D vector image. What we're working with. Um, some cases I don't know if, if you got into this, but some cases I've seen of in terms of rotation. I mean, it, 
the other capability here, I mean, if you take a look at other you know, car manufacturers' websites, if you're looking to buy a car, you can rotate the car around, you can change the color. That's kind of what we're getting into a little bit, right? But it's a different interface. It's lightweight, doesn't require plugins, it's quick to load. Um, but I would say we take the same approach with SVGs as we do with those, those type of um, examples, right? So you click a button, it loads another SVG that's rotated over. Click another button, just, it just rotates. Just incremental. Out. So it doesn't do. The SVG right. is a two dimensional image. Hey, hello, can I, can I, you don't care if the user experience is an SVG as long as it's a Was it an SVG or was it a different composer that was the active output? X. That was the ActiveX plugin. Right, the ActiveX, right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Internet Explorer. Yeah. I mean, well, Explorer. and if I can, I think I actually have a, a little demo that's all done in SVG that might, and you can tell me, might get close to what you're talking about there. Yeah, because I think that's when you're talking about getting an output from Composer uh, that uh, is 3D, and you can rotate it for uh, on the web. That's using the Composer player. So uh, in terms of how that's utilized, it's very similar to eDrawings, ActiveX, as a plugin, as an additional program that has to run to give you that experience. Okay, you can hear me? All right, so what I've got here is a, a real example of something we just did. I've got a, you know, being a small company, one, maybe other people have this problem, but I hate it when people sell my prototypes. It drives me up the wall. Anyway, so I've got a prototype of a controller there, my first and only of that one, and it sold with the truck. So I didn't have much time to get all the information on it, uh, but, what we had is, you know, we, since we've got it in SolidWorks and Composer, you know, I've got, just like what we saw on the mobile devices there, we've got our, you know, SVG, again, it's two-dimensional SVG, it's interactive and things like that. And just like Dave was mentioning there, if we want, we can make any interaction here click outside of this and then onto, say, for instance, A video that's been done, and again, uh, it's just a regular MP4. It doesn't require a, you know, it doesn't require an ActiveX. Now the user doesn't get control of what's going on besides a pause button. And I, you know, it was a little bit fast here, so I hope nobody gets sick on this roller coaster ride of my wire harness. But um, you can at least, you know, if you can't rotate and spin things and have control that way, and if you don't want to have like a an array of of a different angle every five degrees to, to kind of fake the rotation. You know, maybe you can click onto a, a video that that gives a different effect like that. So this is like the AI that was uh, it, It's a video, but it's a .mp4, same type of format that YouTube uses all day long. Right. So it's 
This part of Composer was done with the, the high resolution image, the output. So this is a series of raster images that strung together in Windows Movie Maker with, you know, whatever a uh, one divided by 30 so you can get 30 frames per second transition and then saved as, a, as an animation. The same part from Composer, different workshop, technical illustration workshop, spits out this. So same Composer file using two different workshops, two different outputs and in the end linking them together so you, you know, again the, the, the biggest question is you know, we're in, as engineers our job is to communicate. The job's not done until the information is been communicated well. So who are the people, who's our audience receiving that information and you know, in my case, in our situation, we have people that need it fast and they need it on really limited bandwidth situation. Um, you know, and like Michael said, there's other situations on a shop floor. You can have an EV drawing viewer, you can have an ActiveX and go ahead and give them that control. You know, it really depends who's your audience, who is this going to? And, you know, like, and Earl had a, a, a class just a little while ago and talking about keeping different files, different types of, of setups depending on who is this going to. You know, if I'm going to print, to commercial printing, I'm going to open up a certain type of approach and if I'm going to go to, you know, web, I'm going to have a different type, type of approach. More questions? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, again, this is nothing special, you know, I mean it's a, it was actually, I don't do a lot of animation in Composer, uh, but, you know, walking through the camera views, it really didn't take long at all. I didn't need something that had, you know, a lot of opacity control and texture and all sorts of other bells and whistles. What I needed something was now or, you know, yesterday. And it was exactly you know, again, based on the audience I was working with, it was exactly what they needed and they got it when they needed it. And, you know, it was just a, you know, to be able to have, to put that Google Earth image there as the, as the floor of the, the whole thing and, you know, it just gave out a, a great context for what we were trying to communicate. Uh, on any given day, you know, like I said, I, my main job is I run a shop. So I've got, spend most of my day on the shop floor. I'd say I'd probably spend 50% of my day, any given day might be in SolidWorks um, and less than, way less than 5% of my time is spent playing with Composer. I, in fact, I'm standing here, you know, my biggest concern being asked to speak is like, well, you know, I don't know Composer all that well. I mean, I, it, I'm using it um, and I, I love having it handy, but, you know, I haven't really dug into tons of stuff. It, it really hasn't been, you know, I've, I've taken quite a few classes for SolidWorks. I've taken a lot of other, I've taken one class for Composer. Um, and then I think after you came out and did the class, we got so busy, I didn't even get to touch it again for almost a year. And then, later that year so you know using it just at five ten percent of my time over a one year period I is where I was when I made this video. Very good well thank you everyone for coming if you have any additional questions feel free to come up we'll, we'll talk with you um, but hopefully this helps understand again just how to create these vector images and it's time to end the presentation. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you. Yes, thanks for coming.